Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Mendez. I am a member of the VTC committee and co-host of this workshop. Saigon South International School is honored to be hosting the ninth annual Vietnam Tech Conference in collaboration with Eunice Hanoi. It is also my honor on behalf of the VTC committee to introduce you to Tanya Mansfield, who will talk to us about tax savvy, tax savvy parents in the upcoming workshop. Originally from New Zealand, Tanya has been working in education for 20 years, teaching in New Zealand and international schools in Hong Kong, China, and the UAE, and has been based in Vietnam for the past four years. She has been a PYP practitioner for 18 years, is now the upper primary PYP coordinator at the International School of Ho Chi Minh City. Tanya is a member of the IB Educators Network and works as a workshop leader, a school visitor, an online facilitator, and a curriculum designer. She is currently our co-chair of the Southeast Asian IB PYP Network, which covers Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. Welcome, Tanya Mansfield. Thank you, Daniel. My goodness, that was a mouthful. Good morning, everyone, and Sin Chow. I can see you, but not my screen. Thank you very much, Zoe. That gives me a heads up. So yes, good morning. Um, so today's session is uh, Tech Savvy Parenting. Um, in my role as PYP coordinator, um, Ishmek, I look after our curriculum teams um, and our teaching and learning in our classroom. And through these unprecedented times, um, we have had to obviously consider um, all of our stakeholders. This workshop was originally designed as an interactive conversation. So we will be having some breakout rooms because obviously I am not the uh, be all and end all and um, expertise in any way whatsoever. Um, and I think we all have something to share with each other and um, from each other. So we will be going into that. So who am I? Um, Daniel's all introduced me herself. Um, as my role here, I work at Ishmek here in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, we currently have in our primary context, 635 students from grade three through to 12 years old. And then we also have a secondary campus um, a couple of kilometers down the road here in DT. Um, via, just for those of you um, not within Vietnam, our context with remote learning and home-based learning is it was just over a year last year that we went into home-based learning in different ways. And then we were lucky enough to come back in May um, to face-to-face -face learning with government restrictions. This past Tet holiday, the Lunar New Year holiday around the world, uh, we have gone back to home-based learning, uh, but with our teachers at school. So that has allowed us to continue to collaborate. And of course, the lessons learned through the year as we've had to rethink and reimagine have been part of that. Uh, COVID has actually been a game, oh, sorry, what have I done here? There we go. COVID has obviously been a game changer for all of us. We have had to uh, look at challenges and turn them into opportunities. We have had to consider the roles within education, um, reevaluate, recreate how we um, best serve uh, stakeholders, um, whoever they may be, and basically rethinking our pedagogical practice and our approaches to teaching and learning. It has been a major time for unlearning and relearning for all of us, um, be us leaders or teachers and our students, young and old, and of course our parents. Um, so today we will be focusing on the parents. Obviously there are so many conversations to also support our teachers in this and also our students, whichever level you teach. But um, for this presentation, we'll be focusing on our parents. Um, I just wanna give a shout out to our people that are in India, because I have seen you are just going back to school and I think it was 330 days of home-based learning. Um, so kudos to you. And I think you probably have a lot um, to share with us as a as a cohort here so welcome and well done you and congratulations for having your your learners back on campus so we're going to start with the why um simon sinek's golden circle so why support our parents well research will tell us that our parents and partners in learning really does um, support education and even now in these situations we are more reliant on that partnership 
and building those strong relationships and supporting our parents as our roles change through. Um, even as we have all gone through remote learning, looking different, sounding different, um, and we have had to adjust and adapt and be flexible, uh, it's even more important to continue to nurture those relationships and help our parents at home who are dealing not just with uh, supporting home learning, but also working from home um, and having all those added pressures and things there. All right. So this little uh, Zoom video hit, um, hit, I guess, the, the internet about a month ago. <laughs> um, and it's watching, we're gonna watch a short clip now if you've not seen it, I'm not a cat. It was actually a online virtual legal law situation. And really this just stood out to me that this is exactly how um, some of our parents feel during home learning. So. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to... Uh, uh, take, take we're trying to we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's... I'm here live. It's not. I'm not a cat. I can. I can see that. Um, I think if you click the up arrow next to this. Okay. So this this is really, you know, it's it, um, it shows exactly a lot of how our parents um, are feeling when we're asking them to click on things or use different technologies um, to support their children at home. Exactly that, I'm not a cat, <laughs> but I don't know where to click and I don't know how to click. So using um, the elements of what's nonviolent communicate education, we look at the root of the problem. So really understanding our parents and their context and uh, put the link down here and see this presentation will be shared with you afterwards and the recording, but really understanding the stages of e-learning. And I think all of us have gone through these stages and continue to go through. It's not necessarily cyclical from denial through to quite angry with the situation. Um, and then the bargaining as we try to work out what's what's happening, depression um, and really a, an unhappiness with that uncertainty and something that we need to do and acceptance. And then as the goalposts keep moving and things keep happening, these are the stages that we are all going through and with our parents and their context as things going through and that lack of control um, within their environments at home. So these are the stages of e-learning that Jennifer chang Wathnall put through um, and she's credited here. This is her graphic and she's been using this. I'm going to be using this today in the workshop to, to talk through how we can support our parents through the stages and phases of survive and then strive, thrive, and then hopefully to arrive. Um, and I guess you can see the arrows go back and forth because things keep changing as our digital natives and also as our parents and our teachers and our leaders within the school learn more, adapt more, flexible and become comfortable in different situations. Also, as our situations change, I know we've done um, home-based learning, we've done a hybrid where we've had some children at home or still in quarantine and others in the classroom. We've had others where we've had to do uh, day one with one class in school and the other one at home and day two where they flipped and come back to school. So there's been lots and lots of connotations of what remote learning and learning might look like. So survive is the first phase here. And this is really about making a connection school at home. And I must say, I don't know how well we did this right at the beginning of our journey. We all thought we were just on home learning for a week. And of course, that was all fun and very, <laughs> very novel and innovative. But um, as it dragged on, we realized that actually we, we missed a lot of opportunities to make connections with school and home. So really, this is collection of information and data 
talking to our families to find out what is their situation at home. It could be as basically as what devices do they have? What Wi-Fi do they have? Um, who else is at home to support our learners? Who else is at home that is also learning? Um, and so they so what is their situation and their stresses at home? And so a lot of connection with our parents here. Also, where is their comfort zone with technology? Um, where do they need support? Um, what age groups do they have there? We know we have some older siblings that have been able to help our younger siblings and things there too. Um, and really just connecting and making those situations and collecting all that data and information as leaders. Um, I, as a primary context, our teachers were very much, very much a part of these conversations as they knew their learners, they knew their families and those connections to go through. To spend time with the homeschool conversation. This is the model we used and the graphics come from um, my friend who's currently working in Nanjing, Sonia, um, was our conversations of first connecting with families and discussing the child. How was their child feeling? Uh, were they safe? Were they happy? Uh, were there any um, issues uh, that we needed to support the child with, with this uncertainty and fear, and our counselors were a really big part of that. Next conversation, where were they as a family? Um, what was the situation? And these were quite confidential conversations. You know, people don't like to admit that they're struggling or there's even uncertainty with their job or finances and things, and those all add to our situations. Uh, their environment, more is there quiet places for their children to learn? Is there enough space? Who else is in the um, house? Do they have the technology as in devices, hardware to support home learning? Um, and going through to the next conversation there about learning, how, how tech savvy or tech happy are the parents and people within the home environment? Um, and where are they going to need help so that we could actually focus and then uh, either push our counseling teams towards that family, they're going to need some extra support here or our IT help people or myself as curriculum coordinator and our leaders to help with parent education and parent support there. Okay. So we're going to head into our first breakout rooms here and Daniel's going to help me with these things there. So we're going to have uh, five different groups, but there are a number of different rooms and we've got people that registered beforehand and thank you very much um, for doing that. So I've already put you into groups, but if you've just joined us here, then please just join the group that you feel best suits your role. So when you go into your breakout groups, there's two there for teachers. So just a conversation as how have you as teachers within your context uh, supported your families? There are those of us that have whole school uh, responsibilities. Um, maybe you're um, looking at, uh, we've got a couple there that work with pedagogical coaching um, or advancement guys. So those groups there, how have you supported leaders? How have you connected with families and supported them? Our support teams, so I'm talking here about our learning support teams or our counseling teams. How have you supported your families through the thing? Um, or those that have actually more a tech role. So you're either director of tech or things there. So before we share the breakout rooms, I'm just going to show the next slide here. Where's it gone? Pressing buttons. Uh, so these are some of the rooms we'd already set up. I'll leave them here. But again, if your name's not here, and um, you'd like to actually join the teacher conversation or the leaders or the support teams or whole school or tech. There is a seventh room I've just created, just in case so that we don't have too much, um, too many people in one room then. So the idea is when you go into these breakout rooms is you share, you share how has your school um, supported parents through this survivors phase. Uh, I have created a Padlet which I will share now in the chat as well so that you can add different ways so that we then have a whole bank of resources that support each other um, and we can all continue to learn from each other and continue to build on some of the wonderful things and the wonderful ways that we've gone through. Uh, Daniel set the breakout rooms for eight minutes so it's enough for a conversation and recording and then we'll come back and have, have a little share. 
Okay, and welcome, welcome back to all, are we? Um, would anybody like to share? Uh, there is a Padlet that's been added to the chat, but Daniel and I were just saying, because this is being recorded, uh, we can take notes and I can go and add to the Padlet um, later so that we have a collaboration here. Would anybody like to share from their conversation some things that they've done within their school context to support parents during the survive phase? You can just unmute yourself and go for it. Alan, yes? Yeah, hello. Yeah, so I, I'll kind of join my iPad as well. I think people on iPad or devices weren't automatically put into the room. So, uh, but yeah, we, we got together in the end, thank you. And that's exactly how our parents feel, right? Well, you're on a laptop, but I'm on an iPad and it's asleep, or I'm on iOS and you're on Apple. So it's those, I guess, the, the mindset of where we're just gonna, we're just going to have a go and keep learning to unlearn so um and going for it so alan yes what was your conversation within your group there what are some of the things you can support others with um, just the, the, well the variety of um uh different scenarios is incredible so just appreciating that i think we're all in very unique situations whether that's venezuela uh, vietnam myanmar and so on um, and just trying to keep open it, the open communication as far as possible systems were in place from before as well which have helped i think uh, so some people are now transitioning back into uh, into school but taking the learning from their experience into that um, and i think it's, it's just then trying to prepare and adapt for if this happens again absolutely and and i think the feeling is is that we are going to see this um happen again but in different ways throughout the world um and have to respond as we go through. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Anybody else from another group, maybe from some of our teachers? Um, you're the ones that are you know, on the front lines supporting our parents. Um, I'm not a teacher, but I am a tech coach, a STEM coach at my school. And one of the things we did um, you know, we, I think everybody kind of went through the same iterations of, of, of teaching and learning online. Uh, we first went into, um, you know, sending home uh, materials, having asynchronous lessons where we would prepare a lesson, do a video, send a, 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 a slideshow home. Kids would do stuff, turn things in and kind of like this kind of method where they'd hold a picture up in front of their um, head and um, and it was exhausting for everyone involved. And so we started to and I as a coach, I, I get to go into the metrics of how our school uses things like the seesaw platform and at the height of our of our um, of our pandemic closure, there was at one point our teachers had sent out 8,000 items to families in the elementary school. And um, that was insane. And um, was able to bring that data to our teams and say, there's gotta be something different that we can be doing that isn't so, like 8,000 pieces for you is a lot. And that's parents too going through, you know, hundreds of items to try to understand whether their students are doing the right thing or not. So we switched into synchronous learning, but again, it had its pitfalls and we had scheduling things. But what we started to do is we started to ask questions, um, kind of Goldilocks questions to our parents. Uh, is it too much, too little, or just right? And um, when we started to ask those Goldilocks questions about all sorts of things, is the amount of tech you have too much, too little, too just right? Um, asking about is the type of engagements your students are doing, is it too much, too little, just right? Are they going outside and getting outdoor time? Too much, too little, just right. And we started to get a better picture of how students and families were engaging with the learning, engaging with wellness, engaging with um, each other. Um, and we were able to start to pare down what we were offering so that it felt like the right size um, for our families. And of course there were a little like, whenever we said there's you know 30% of our families who are like, no, we want more stuff. Um, we sometimes, we, we figured out who those people were and engaged with those kind of pa parents and families individually. Um, and, um, 
And certainly the ones who are saying there's way too much stuff. Um, we try to reach out, I think, in a lot of different ways through teachers, through counselors about um, finding out what the real scenario was. Was it parents who were, you know, if parents were actually out of the country and their children were going to school here, living with their nannies? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you have these dynamic situations where um, you're just in survival mode. So we tried to figure that out. And then as we got we came into the fall this year without being in lockdown, but we planned as if we were going to go into lockdown. So we put in policies in place about schedule. Um, we looked at how, what is the just right number of hours that a student would be on a screen, um, and we planned accordingly. So when we got into virtual school this year, we already had like a schedule of like, this is how you're going to meet with your students and, and, and was really clear with parents about what was required. And I think that's reduced our uh, stress load incredibly and parents are now saying things are just right way more often than not. Thank you. I love the Goldilocks. Yeah, too much, too little. To think. And I think that that as we all started this journey, we we just jumped in. We jumped in as educators. We jumped in as leaders. Some of us tried to um, uh, completely mirror what was happening in the classroom. Some were trying to be more innovative and creative. But uh, I know, and that's what I said, I don't think in our context, we spent enough time on survive, like actually connecting with parents. And as we learned, we actually went back a step to do exactly as you say, connecting with our parents, finding out why. And even those parents that wanted more, we want more uh, using the resources we have at school as in the people as to find out why. Why did they want more? And really um, it came down to, they wanted their children to be busy. You know, they, they were busy online. So trying to, especially in my role as curriculum coordinator, talking to parents about actually what does learning look like? And I, I think my big takeaway was our parents really didn't understand what happens in our classrooms day to day in face-to-face -face learning. They think we as teachers are standing in front of, a screen, of children all day long at the whiteboard um, or things like that. And so there was a constant conversation and a constant education, um, but with that uh, lens of compassion and caring that this is not easy for everyone and, and our roles have now have to become diverse and flexible um, and so many lessons learned. And thank you, Katina. Katina, am I saying it right? Yes, uh, correct. For, for sharing there too. Okay, so I'm gonna go back because we're gonna go on to our next stage, which was the, the strive, let me share my screen here. Um, and there we go. All right, can I get a thumbs up if you can see that for me? Thanks, Katina, you're a star. Okay, so our next stage in the cycle is actually the strive. Um, she says, pressing a button. Here we go. So the strive phase is actually, now we have all that data, now we have all that information how can we best support our learners and how can we best support our parents? Because to be honest, from our eight-year-olds up, if our children, our learners are confident and competent and can have some level of independence, then that in turn is gonna help our parents. Um, I've had a number of conversations this last week with our grade three parents to say, I know that this is new to you, but your children have got this. So trust your children. Um, they, we have spent time upskilling them and supporting them too. So with Strive, we start with, she says, pressing the button and nothing's happening. So we start with the strength-based model. So taking all of that data and information that we've collected from our families, bringing our counselors into the conversation as well and our tech team. So really our, our school community on the ground um, bring all of the expertise together here. So considering what can our learners do? Um, what do they know what to do? What are they confident and competent with it? And where can we take some of the pressure off our parents because our, our children are able to manage this with a certain level of independence? Uh, through the survive phase, when we were questioning parents, we discovered our KG to grade two children already knew or already were um, familiar um, with using an iPad or their parents' phone. 
Um, so it was then directing them to the best way forward. They knew how to click on a YouTube video. They knew how to click on um, a URL code. And even that word click on, we had a conversation with parents the other day. We said, what do I click? There's nothing to click. I went, oh, so you tap or you press play or you, you know, the, just those conversations, especially when we're dealing with a range of EAL, oh, sorry, not EAL, but language, language learning and conversations here. Uh, one big lesson we learned, we're very lucky at Ishmael, our grade three to fives have one-to-one -one iPads. So as soon as we went into this as a second phase, we sent that, those iPads home. And that was a game changer for families because again, our children were using devices that they were familiar with and able to use um, at home with a level of independence. And of course, using the apps rather than a URL um, really did support all the learners and throughs there. Uh, we had already set up responsible use agreements at home. We then doctored or adapted some of them for our younger learners that this is how we use our netiquette and this is how we go through things there. Um, this was also uh, a time to, uh, as Katina just mentioned, to actually talk to our teachers about how are we going to ensure that this is deep and meaningful and uh, simple rather than too much, too noise. Um, our teachers are very excited about seesaw activities, for, for example, but actually they became overwhelming, overwhelming for our learners and overwhelming for our parents. Um, and so again, doing, doing a few things really well rather than doing lots of things that was overwhelming and really, I guess, keeping each other accountable and really true to the values of what we best believe as a school um, and as a program for um, teaching and learning as such. So we our beautiful tech department and working with our teachers. We had already set up keep pressing buttons and they don't okay. um, Well, we have what we call a self-service. And um, we were able to push this out. And um, that meant that our families had access to all the apps that we might be using um, through things. As a curriculum coordinator, I, I am a user. Um, this, but it was our tech department that supported us for things here. And then teachers knew what our children and our families had um, uh, accessible at their fingertips there. Um, and some of those apps uh, would include the things that we were using. So Tumble Books is an online reading, so storyline online. And we, uh, for those of you not in Vietnam, we find it really difficult to actually get books within Vietnam. So using eBooks um, and things there really help. And some of these actually will, they're an audio book as well as a reading online. So that helped our younger learners who are reading. Um, things there. So it was just again supporting our parents. For those of you, I'm sure most of you know about Common Sense Media, there is also an incredible platform there ex for parents with a number of online videos that they can support. But actually, as curriculum coordinator working with my tech team, we actually had online education uh, workshops for parents um, once a week in the morning. Um, some was we had decided the area to focus on and others, it was an open coffee morning, uh, like an office hours. What do you need help with and where can we help from there? When we first started this journey, our uh, teachers were using a variety of online platforms uh, from Zoom to Google Meet to GoToMeet to other things. And again, we learned just one platform because we, so we all using Google Meet because we obviously had homes where there are multiple siblings and Again, that was a really big lesson for us about keeping consistency across the, the primary school so that it doesn't matter if your child is in grade four, grade two, or KG, what you were receiving as parents looked the same, felt the same, and there wasn't a number of uh, different platforms or things to choose there. So that was a uh, really big thing. As I say, we put the, with our grade threes and up, uh, we put the kids out. With our lower primary learners, we learned very quickly that we were actually talking to our audience was our parents. It was our parents then supporting our child, our children. And then of course, 
what what was the balance we don't want any of our learners on screen all day long so ensuring that through our home learning and remote learning there was a balance there and maybe they might go and watch something but there was opportunities for them to go and use a hands-on or take a break or go and explore outdoors if that was possible in your context and ensuring that balance there also ensuring that things were developmentally appropriate and that mix of uh, asynchronous and synchronous so we have community time every morning where everyone is welcome to come that looks different whether you're uh, 11 years old or three years old um, and who's leading it but it's the time to connect because as we learn through the social side is so important um, and our counselors were a really big part of that um, we had as i'm sure you have in all your contexts we had children that had not left the apartment for 16 weeks, who had not actually physically seen a friend. Um, and so those social connections and that time to hang out, um, our teachers were around online, but just hang out online was, was really important. Um, and to show all the puppy dogs and the kittens and your favorite cuddly toy was also really, really important. It, and it is, it's part of, of their, their lines of things there um but especially i think we've had to work the hardest with our ee to grade one uh, grade two parents because it's supporting their stress levels so that they can then support their children and also giving them permission to let go it's okay take a day off it's all right you know there's this whole social media feed on um lost learning um, and we as educators know it will be okay because we meet our children where they are we meet our children where we are and we go through. We also went from the whole beautiful community time to small group, small, small group check-ins and many lessons. Um, and of course, we know our little people that needed that extra um, chat. So we would organize individuals, but not just with the teacher. Um, there were a number of other people in the community that were available for those families. Our counselors were incredible, our learning support. Um, myself as coordinator with Stefan, just to just to make a connection or support or listen to a reading or read to them with, or help them with the maths problem, whatever was happening through them. Uh, this graphic here is from the IB. We are a PYP school. Um, and so just part of the stage of Strive is learning technology um, and learning what each tool might be used for things there. I think our biggest lesson as we did come back face to face was ensuring that we had upskilled our learners so that they were independent and able to um, use each tool's functionality and also to problem solve um, and to be able to go through things there too. Um, and through our classroom, we are constantly learning through technology, but overhanging, I think, is this always thing if and when, it wasn't a if, when, we have to go back to a home-based learning model. Um, what technology can we use to extend learning in the classroom? Uh, just a word on our secondary, because I know we have a few here from secondary. Our secondary uh, school use a platform called Sector. And so all the learning is online and they were using, um, and is there and the children, again, secondary kids, a little bit more independent, able to read, able to connect. They had office hours um, and using Google Meets and slides. So, in fact, apart from meeting in the classroom, the secondary uh, model, the, the, the lives really didn't change. And I have two teenagers here at home and used to pop into support as a mother, as a parent. And I've got this, you know, we know what we have to do. Um, and, and we know who is available for us if we, if we need and how we go through there. And in some ways for our secondary, uh, I know my son's in his final year he says he's actually got more time, more time to study, but more access to teachers. Um, so I think with their, their context, again, it's completely different from, from our elementary. So considering our parents, our children are digital natives, but our parents are digital immigrants. Um, we have so many parents that the only device they have is their phone. And as we've just, you know, we heard from Alan there, when you're on an iPad, it looks different when you're on a laptop, whether you're using Apple or others, it all looks different. So really considering who our parents were, um, and that was all the information we used and uh, we collected and survived. And then how do we support them as we go through into the strive stage? Um, so again, 
we as educators had to not just consider our learners, which is very normal, but also to consider our parents who were along this pathway journey with us and learning um, go through there. These are the four stages of learning anything. And I think this is where some of our parents were, you know, I'm not a cat type situation is they didn't know what they don't know and really understanding that. And I think that's why the survive phase is so important. Our parents had never used Google Meet. Some had never been on a Google platform before. Um, some um, stood, still had Hotmail um, emails um, uh, or had never done anything or hadn't actually used Seesaw at home as in loading documents, things like that. So really actually understanding that this is where a lot of parents were and having to work not only when we were on home base, but when we came back to continue that education, continue that support so that we can help there. We had a few families that reached out and said, we don't have enough devices and our IT department pr provided them, provided extra devices because we want learning to continue and we want to support those families as best they go there. So the strive phase is really taking all that data um, and us as leaders in the school and as educators working out, okay, so what best works? Are we going to use Zoom? Are we going to use Google Meet? Uh, as Katina said earlier, and thank you, less is more. What are we going to do well? Quality over quantity. And what things are we going to put in place to um, support our teams? So this is another chance for a quick breakout room. Daniel, if you can help me again here, please. Um, and just again, as you went into that strive phase and, and some of us, I know for us, we went straight to strive and we didn't take time to survive. But really once we've learned these lessons here, how have we uh, then supported our parents through our strive phase? So I'm just gonna open up the breakout rooms again. And there is another Padlet, which I will also share in the chat room. Um, so that you can start adding there too. So Daniel, can you help with the breakout rooms? There yeah, are? breakout rooms are already uh, in progress. So I just need to put the new people in. Okay, fantastic. And I will share the second Padlet here now. All people are in breakout rooms. Thank you, my friend. Great job. Thank you. Okay, there's the second paddle up. There are some um, good questions and some good statements in the chat if you want to take a moment to look at some of those. Oh, cool. oh, oh. 
time. <laughs> Say that again. Sorry, I, I was working on uh, the room. Right, just time. Just time. Okay. We got five minutes left <laughs> in the breakout room. No, five minutes in the breakout room, five minutes, uh, 10 minutes in the whole thing. Great. Thanks. So there's uh, four minutes left in the breakout rooms. People are still talking. No one's come out of the breakout rooms. So um, yeah, so are, how are you feeling about the last? We can go over by a little bit. It's fine by me. If you feel like you need to go a little bit longer, I'll just judge, but you know, five minutes or so. I can click through a few because I know they'll have copies later. Yeah. Uh, the PDFs and things like that. So they're graphics, so that's no problem. Um, and there's no more breakout rooms, so it's just a, and then the links and resources are there for them to view. Okay. There. Good. So I will just give you a, a direct message with a one minute warning just to close up and then I will, I will thank you for being a wonderful presenter. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think I'll just ask for one share back this time, just for maybe from a teacher's point of view. Okay, sounds good. All right. Uh, less than three minutes left. Two minutes left. One minute warning.
30 seconds, 30 seconds. Might be coming back now. We're getting the message. And welcome back, everyone. Coming in here. Great. Thank you very much for your engagement there with the strive um, phase. Things that can we maybe hear from one of the conversations? I was thinking maybe someone from India who this has definitely been a long haul uh, learning situation, or we have someone from Myanmar here. So, as well as the COVID 19, they've also had to deal with a coup. Um, and so home-based learning is things there too. Anybody like to support on how they have best supported parents through the strive phase as we've gone into things there? I'm, I'm happy to, to talk. Um, we talked a little bit about the importance of um, like modifying and individualizing um, curriculum to, to meet parents and kids where they are. Um, and that sometimes like the best way to help parents strive is by offering forgiveness and saying like, it's okay. It's okay if you can't get to everything right now. Like sort of, I think in the beginning there was this um, push to like everyone had to do everything and every parent was at home being like, oh my God, we have 17 seesaw assignments to do today. And at some point saying like, take a breath, it's okay. Um, and uh, and saying, get what get what you can, like get get wherever you can, and try to keep your child sane and happy. And if that means doing three assignments instead of seventeen, that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And and we all know that um, we learn when we're feeling safe and happy. Um, you know that whole Maslow's hierarchy, and we need to ensure that. Um, I think we very much quickly switched from, and we were always this way with our values. That's what I mean, adhering to your values of your school, children first, learner first, curriculum will follow. Um, and, it, and as you say, it will be okay. We will get through this. And we're, it's a, as I think it's a global pandemic. This is something that is happening all over the world. Um, and it is best to actually look after our, our social and emotional needs and things there too. Have we got any counselors here that would like to share from their perspective? Because um, you know, you're, you're a huge part of this conversation and supporting our parents at home. We had a couple of counselors register, but maybe not here at the moment. Okay. Okay, well, we've got five minutes less. I'm just gonna share my screen and continue the conversation as we go through here. Okay, so within the strive, uh, here we go. Here we go within the strive phase, um, and Katina brought this up earlier as well, was more a support system um, for parents the whole way through. So instructional videos that both learners and parents could go back and watch and pause. Uh, one-way webinars. Um, again, we had lots of language support. We are lucky to have a Korean liaison here and a Vietnamese liaison. Our TAs, our teaching assistants, Vietnamese TAs were a huge resource to support parents and talk them through things live um, as we were sharing our screens. Our IT department, um, having office hours and also being available and setting those things up. Uh, considering our parents, um, and again, that came from the data that we got from information, uh, where, what was the language that's being spoken at home? How could we further support them and things there too? Um, quality, not quantity. So no stress, um, no pressure, not everything has to be done today um, and allowing time. And you know, there, there is no, if you're having tantrums or meltdowns or things at home or unhappiness, just let it go and having permission to do that, you know, that compassion and care the whole time too. 
Uh, well, you obviously had a number of graphics, I'll show you a couple in a minute, of graphics and maybe some flow charts to help parents step by step. So multiple, multiple pathways to help our parents as we go through, but also considering that we're not overwhelming our parents with information. We found that even though we were trying to be supported, we had messages from head of school, we had messages from myself, we had messages from our principals, we had messages from our teachers, and it was just becoming a really overwhelming situation for parents because they weren't sure where to look. And then they had their own parents' WhatsApp groups and they had all the social media and the news and it was just coming. So we made a decision that um, the, the big news as in school closures and those steps would come from head of school, but pretty much everything else would come from the teacher because that was their their go-to person, their on the ground person, their front line person, um, who they had that relationship. And that was one way we, we tried to cut down those things um, for our pink there. So these are some of the graphics and I know there are wonderful ones all around the world, um, just sharing what we had at Ishmik. Um, our counseling team worked with um, our teams to um, sort this graphic out and the link is there if you want to see the whole link um, using our Ishmik. Um, I, S, H, C, M, things there. We have, we value mindfulness in a really big way at school and it is just who we are. We found in our first wave, we, we completely forgot about mindfulness. I think we rushed into everything. We were all about the learning and lessons learned was to actually our social emotional is so important. And so mindfulness has been brought back in um, twice a day um, for opportunities for our families and our um, children to connect there. Uh, this is another one talking about netiquette. So we have responsible use agreements with our older children um, and we worked with parents of the younger children um, on netiquette and really keeping an eye out for inappropriate um, conversations online. Uh, Google Hangouts became a sudden thing that we had to keep an eye on. Um, to again, just supporting families at home and things there. Uh, this is from one of our Cognita sister schools, uh, Tim Evans, who's in Stanford, Hong Kong. And he had a little uh, graphic here, which um, has been really useful, just how to set yourself up for learning. Um, and this whole mute yourself, but then you are on mute. So, you know, I think it's the most spoken phrase in 2020 is that you are on mute. Um, things there. Uh, there's a group that does March Media Mentor Month. Um, uh, Beasley at WAB, at Western, have this wonderful graphic. And actually, we supported this with parents that once a day, just giving an opportunity for um, parents to learn with their children, alongside their children, and their children actually becoming, um, I guess, the experts and sharing with them. So, this was a nice little this is your, your connection for the day and trying to build up parent um, uh, knowledge and support uh, as, they, as they go through the tech things there. It's, as it's March now, it's just about to come on out and I think they've gamified it this year. So if you haven't seen March Media Month, then um, you can go on, a, uh, on the Google or I can give you her Twitter handle. Um, they do some great things there. Uh, I also am um, quite big on Twitter and we work with a professional learning network. So I reached out to a couple of mine and said, how, how did you support parents um, do different things? So Mel in Bangkok, um, they did have a leadership Zoom session, coffee morning with parents. Um, they have line. Um, so parents were able to, they're a smaller school community. Um, we have WhatsApp with ours and we really rely on our class parents who, who lead that WhatsApp group so that we can try and put out fires become the, before they come too big and try and address little issues, um, those things that happen. They also set up a Google site specifically and she's been very generous and shared her Google site to support her parents. Uh, Bronnie, who's in Oman, um, they set up individual counseling sessions for their families um, to opt in and opt out again, uh, both live and recorded mini workshops on how to support children and then a number of different handouts. Uh, they did a Wellness Wednesday and I've heard this called Wi-Fi Free Wednesday. And we um, also had this, we called it Spotlight on Specialists. 
And that gave us a day where we could focus on our specialists because we found they were being left out. And as an IB PYP school, our specialists, our arts and our music, our um, fab lab and our world languages and PE are a really big part of our curriculum. Um, it also gave our teachers a little bit of a breath um, to plan quality rather than quantity. Um, but it also ensured that balance, that balance through um, our home-based learning there. So things there too. So the next stage is Thrive. And now this is a, situ a stage and I, I feel like this time around there was more thriving going on than surviving. Um, everyone, all stakeholders feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, teachers are now actually focusing on pedagogical practice and strategies to continue to engage and motivate their children um, through that because we have the independence and the knowledge and the confidence of the digital tools. Um, we are now into more of a routine. And so again, uh, ensuring that we've got the same templates and the same uh, view as we're pushing out learning situations. And really, again, keep us accountable instead of nonstop, someone mentioned before, the seesaw assignments and seesaw activities is keeping them nice and simple. Really, is this busy work or is this deep learning? Um, and really considering things there. In the Thrive, really considering that balance of asynchronous and synchronous. Um, screen time is obviously a, a big issue and how can we ensure balance throughout that? And that wellness, that wellness um, as we go through there. Um, with Thrive, I think the big messages are, and this has been brought up already, so thank you, is that less is more. Uh, that we vary what our class interactions look like. It could be whole class, it could be small groups, it could be individuals and um, personalization and connectivity, which is why our survive is so important, that survive stage, knowing who we've got and who might need some extra support. When we are planning learning engagements, ensuring they're low entry, high ceiling, so there are multiple ways of, of uh, completing this learning engagement and we can do it a number of different ways and it would suit um, all of our learners. That we're continuing to monitor our students and teachers connections. So just keeping an eye on um, who is online and when, um, and making sure we're connect, continually connecting with them to check that the family is all okay. Uh, we just had one family that just decided to stay at the beach. So she tuned in when she could and she was at the beach and that is absolutely perfectly fine. That family time is fantastic. Teaching assistants, I've already managed. Meaningful feedback, um, again, to ensure that what is happening at home is valued and feedback is given to help them progress through their learning is really, and CESOL is our main way of supporting that. And again, uh, opportunities for social interaction and for children to connect, both real and online. At this stage, I know we had families organizing little study groups where they would go around each other's houses because we are able to here in Vietnam. But when we were in lockdown, as uh, I know a lot of you have been, you know, that social interaction was actually really key. So after the Thrive phase, we get to Arrive. So Arrive is, um, we're all comfortable. Everyone knows what they're doing. Everyone is, we've managed the point where all of us are um, feeling a little bit more in control that um, our students are engaged. Um, and as my eldest will say, I got this um, situation. Um, students are independent and parents have the resources, whether they be offline or online that we need. Uh, Katina brought up in the chat, and thank you, was uh, one lesson we learned is our younger children, their parents would have appreciated just the basics for helping with learning. So we did prepare packs of maths books and some activities. We had some Play-Doh, um, some construction materials and things like that, that were available at school for us, our parents to come and pick up because uh, again, we, we are equipped for those sorts of different monies, but we found our parents were needing support. So arrive is the final phase. And as we go back to Jennifer's graphic, and I think the really big message is, is that it's a continual cycle and it doesn't necessarily go cyclical. You can jump from one stage to the other as your context and your situation changes. Um, 
we had to pause and go back to survive at one stage, really making sure we had things, um, but then we moved faster through Strive and uh, we were in a Thrive situation. Um, ensuring not all of our community are at the same stage at the same time, and that is okay. Um, and it's to that one, one size doesn't fit all type of situations. Um, and that we were continuing to do well-being check-ins. But this graphic really helped to ground us that this is where we are and that is okay. There is no race, there is no pressure. We have to consider where we are and what we need. So just in summary, I'm just gonna close off these. Um, is the big ideas about today is, I think we've all learned one size does not fit all, even within your school context. What suits our earliers does not suit our grade twos, our grade fours and fives, and definitely not our secondary. So everything is relevant to your context. Sharing ideas and bringing ideas in to support your parents, um, but it's, it's not a cookie cutter situation by any means. Clear communication um, that reflects your own school values and philosophy. Um, and really ensuring that you're not overwhelming parents and families. Uh, Jennifer, through her things, and I think through my own research and learning, it is so important for us to be spending quality time in survive and strive. If we can get survive and strive correct, then we can get our families through to the thrive process so much faster. Uh, consistency across schools, we've already talked about because was overwhelming our parents if they were seeing different things in different grade levels and ensuring that we are available, that we have support networks and systems set up, we have people available to our families and our parents as they need. Upskilling our learners when we have the opportunity to, even taking time on our point. Today, we're just going to learn how to use Google Slides and so that they are then confident and confident, and that way their parents um, don't have to spend as much time supporting them. The other big one for me as a curriculum coordinator and teaching and learning was actually continuing to support our parents in their understanding of how we teach and how we learn so that we could um, get away from this, this feeling that teachers were just standing at the whiteboard all day long and that fact um, those balances and things were there go through. Um, I will share the slides. As I said before, there are a number of resources here for you. This is uh, Dylan Meikles just come out with a new book, Learning in Lockdown, um, to support parents and families you might like. And then I've added a whole load of resources and references for you um, that you can take your time or introduce to your school's community and some things there might support you all. So I want to say thank you all. Um, and thank you for your conversations and um, for your adding your own expertise and sharing with each other. And we will go back through the Padlet and um, continue to build that bank of support there for you all. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Tanya, for a wonderful presentation. I got a lot out of it with a lot of little nuggets that I'm sure we all have taken. So thank you again for a wonderful, on behalf of the VTC committee, we thank you for your wonderful presentation. Can we all give her a round of applause? Uh, no. yeah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, we encourage that the conversation continue on through the Whova app, through the conference app. If you have any questions, that, that's how you can get a hold of her um, over this next day and, and onwards. So we'd like to continue that conversation, all right? Have a wonderful rest of the conference, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank Zoe, you. That, Zoe, that's great news. Hanoi schools are opening. Hooray.